All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and introduce today's speakers. Today we have Lisa Mason. She is the horticulture agent and current interim director in Arapahoe County. She is also a distinguished scholar graduate from Colorado State University, where she conducted her research on native bees and developed the Native Bee Watch program. This is a popular citizen science program where you can also get involved and registration is still open. So you can check out nativebeewatch.org for more information on that. We also have Darren Davidson. She is the CSU Extension Agent in Boulder County. She's very passionate about pollinators and helping people to understand how to best support you know, them through their creating of their new habitats. Darren is very involved with the Colorado Native Plant Society and helps to plan their annual conference each year as well. So two fabulous speakers today to help us celebrate pollinators um, and also it's happy pollinator, Colorado Pollinator Month. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa. Okay, hi everybody, welcome. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you about uh, one of my favorite topics and that is pollinators. So let's get started. Okay, today we're gonna cover why do we need pollinators? Why are they important? Who are the pollinators? We'll cover safety concerns and stings. And because we always get questions, uh, we'll cover wasp control, um, a little bit about beekeeping, and then we're gonna dive into habitat, um, considerations, site assessment, design, plant selection, and maintenance. Um, and we'll do our best to answer your questions as we go. All right, so let's talk about big picture. Why do we care about insects? Why, why do we need insects? Well, the, the short answer is we cannot survive without them. Um, famous uh, biologist and naturalist E.O. Wilson uh, estimates that we would only be able to survive a few months without insects on our planet. And many insects provide Oh, so many ecosystem services that we often take for granted. And pollinators is one of the more well-known groups um, because that's where our food comes from. And pollinators are struggling. Um, insects are, are struggling. Um, same, you know, similar to, to our wildlife populations. And the biggest reason is urbanization. We are losing habitat spaces for our pollinators um, all, all over. Uh, in just in the United States alone, we're losing about 6,000 acres per day. Um, that adds up to about 2.2 million acres per year. But the, the silver lining in all of this is that urban spaces can support pollinators. So we figure um, in North America, about 82% of the population lives in North America. And it's, our urban spaces are just gonna continue to grow. Well, pollinators need a, a small space and anyone can be part of the solution for pollinator conservation. They just need habitat spaces and flowers. And pollinators are critical to our ecosystem, so humans depend on them, but also they're, they're really the foundation of so many of our ecosystems. 75% of the world's plants rely on pollinators, on insects for reproduction. Imagine a world without three quarters of the plants in, in our world. It's, um, we, we couldn't do it, it'd be a completely different place. So they're very critical for our ecosystems. In terms of human impacts, approximately one third of the world's, um, of our diet is dependent on pollinators. That's about one in every three bites of food. Um, that is, you know, typically is our fruits, our vegetables and our nuts, but everything's connected. Um, our cattle, our meat and dairy industries are also dependent on pollinators because these pollinate alfalfa and clover, which feed the cattle. So everything's connected. Um, bees alone pollinate about $15 billion worth of crops each year. Um, that translates to about 87 crops that are dependent on pollinators for reproduction. So what is pollination? Well, that could be a whole other presentation in itself, but the, the short answer is uh, the, the 
pollination is facilitating plant reproduction. So for instance, when a bee visits a flower, she's visiting that flower for that pollen and nectar reward. She doesn't know she's doing the plants any favors, but in the process, she's going to visit a flower that looks very attractive to her. Um, and she's going to, she's going to go drink that nectar and, and bees have very, um, hairy bodies. So when they go into the flower, the pollen grains stick to the bee's body. And then she's going to go visit another flower. And in that process, some of those pollen grains will be deposited into the next flower, um, thus facilitating plant reproduction. Next slide. And bees can self-pollinate, so they can visit flowers on the same plant to facilitate that plant reproduction, or they can visit another plant of the same species to, to facilitate that plant reproduction. We'll learn a little bit more, but bees like to visit groups of the same plants, helping with that pollination process. And so what happens when we don't have sufficient pollination, well, we don't get very good fruit development. We don't get that, that fruit that we're um, accustomed to eating. So here's a few examples, you know, strawberries and apple um, and a raspberry. And so we're going to talk a lot about bees, but before we do, in, you know, to celebrate all the pollinators, let's give a shout out to all of our other pollinators that are not bees that play very important roles in our ecosystem. And you can follow, you can find these pollinators right in your backyard in your own landscape. So let's talk about hummingbirds first. Uh, we have four species of hummingbirds that are commonly seen in Colorado. They are migratory. Um, they just arrived about mid to end of April. Um, and they love to visit flowers that are red um, and long, long tubular flowers. So a lot of, there's a lot of excellent native plants that they love to visit. And in the photo here, look at the top of her head. Um, she's got little pollen grains on the top of her head, um, helping to, to pollinate those plants. Wasps. Now we're going to talk more about wasps here in a little bit, but some wasps are actually pollinators. And in this photo here, you're going to see um, it's a group of wasps called pollen wasps. So they actually specialize. Uh, most wasps are will feed on other insects, you know, they're, they're carnivores, but this special group, group of wasps actually feeds on pollen and nectar only, just like bees do. And so um, you'll find them hanging, hanging out in penstemon flowers quite often. So look for those pointy abdomens. Um, those are pollen wasps that help uh, pollinate plants. And then we have flies. We're going to talk a little bit more about flies too, but Flies, uh, we have a lot of different flower visiting flies. And some of our flower visiting flies provide two benefits. So they're pollinators, but the larval form of surfid flies will actually feed on aphids and help provide pest control in our gardens. So flower visiting flies are a really great addition to our gardens. And bats. So in Colorado, we have 18 species of bats. Um, in Colorado, they're mostly insect feeders, so they feed on mosquitoes and, and other pest insects, providing pest control services for us. Um, but if you go further south, uh, they're a very important pollinator to cactus and, and other plants. Um, a classic example is bats pollinate the agave plant, which is how they make tequila. So next time you enjoy a margarita, be sure to, to thank the bats for, for that margarita. Moths are also pollinators. So moths that visit flowers for nectar, um, they're often visiting those flowers in the evening and, and at dusk. Moths have long um, tongues called a proboscis. And so they often visit flowers with long spurs. So in the photo, you'll see a white lined sphinx moth, a, a very common moth you'll see around here. Um, and, and she's visiting a white columbine. So a lot of moths, um, are, can be excellent pollinators as well. Butterflies too, we have over 250 species of butterflies here in Colorado. To compare, we have about a thousand species of moths in Colorado. So 250 species of butterflies. The key to attracting butterflies to your landscape is to plant that caterpillar host food. Each species has a different caterpillar host plant.
Butterflies love brightly colored flowers and they often like a, a landing pad so they can land on the, the cluster of flowers to get that nectar. And then beetles. Here in the photo, you'll see a soldier beetle on a rabbit brush plant, which is a, a late blooming plant. Uh, you'll see all kinds of insects on, on rabbit brush, but beetles especially love it. Uh, and because they, they feed on the pollen and nectar, they can actually facilitate um, plant reproduction as well. So shout out to other our non-bee pollen. Pollinators. But now let's switch gears and talk a little bit more about bees. Now bees are often the most efficient pollinators because they have so many hairs on their body. And worldwide, we have over 20,000 species of bees. Here in North America, we have over 4,000. And in Colorado, we have about 946 species of bees. And they come in all shapes and sizes. Some like queen bumblebees can be up to an inch long or over an inch long. Other bees might be as tiny as an eighth of an inch and all different um, shapes and colors as well. Now bees, with the amount of diversity that we have, these are very difficult to identify. So quite often you need a microscope and a high level of taxonomy to, to be able to identify bees to a species level. So when we talk about bees, we often refer to them as a, a genus level, so which is a, a group of species. And, and that's a good way to, to, um, to refer to bees. Okay, so let's look at our bee diversity compared to other states. So California, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, they have us beat in terms of number of species. Um, and that's because bees love uh, arid to semi-arid, you know, desert-like areas. Colorado's up there though, um, for two reasons. First of all, we have a diverse uh, range of ecosystems and elevations here in Colorado. Um, that provides um, different habitats for different types of bees. Second of all is we have two universities that have done a significant amount of research on bees, and that includes Colorado State University and University of Colorado in Boulder. So quite often, the more research that is done to understand the bee diversity, the more diversity is discovered. So it's very, it's quite possible that states with lower bee diversity um, don't, don't even know the bee diversity they have. These are very difficult to study. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating field. And most people are familiar with the honeybee. The honeybee is a very important crop pollinator um, here, here in the United States and, and North America. But we have a variety of, of native bees, wild bees, that are important crop pollinators too. And some are very specialized. So here's a few examples. Bumblebees, uh, they do something called buzz pollination. So when they land on a specific plant, they have a special vibration that releases the pollen from the plant. So bumblebees pollinate um, tomatoes and peppers, so plants in the Solanaceae family, and they also pollinate blueberries. All those plants need buzz pollination. So a honeybee could land on a tomato plant, but it just wouldn't be able to pollinate it. Cactus bees. Oh, it's almost cactus blooming season here on the front range. Um, I highly recommend watching cactus flowers. You'll see all kinds of, of insects visiting those cactus flowers, but there's some bees that specialize in pollinating cactus flowers. And then squash bees. For those of you that grow squash and pumpkins, oh, I highly recommend um, looking inside those big yellow flowers in the early mornings and you'll see squash bees go into town pollinating those plants. I um, mean, it's one of those you plant it and the, the squash bees will come. They're a native bee and they are so efficient. Um, honeybees might visit the flowers, but the squash bees will have it done in no time. Okay, so a little bit more about bees. To, to provide habitat for bees, it's important to understand a little bit about their life cycles. So we're going to talk about three different life cycles. Um, the first one are, are eusocial bees. So we have one species that fall into this category, and that is our honeybee. So a, a eusocial bee is defined as bees that have overlapping generations, a reproductive division of labor, and cooperative brood care. So honeybees live typically in man-made hive boxes. There's a queen, and she's the only one that lays eggs within that colony. 
when the bees reach a certain age, it's about, I think like nine or 10 days old, um, their job is actually to care for the, the baby bees in that colony. So each bee has a special job depending on its age in the colony. So social bees worldwide comprise of about 10% of all bee species. Most bees are not social, so we'll talk more about that. And so honeybees, it's also important to know, honeybees uh, we brought over to North America in the 1600s. So they're technically a non-native bee species and they are a managed species. So they're actually considered livestock. So we breed honeybees, you can buy them. When a beekeeper loses a colony, they can actually buy a new colony the following year. This is a very important distinction for when we talk about the next category of bees because honeybees are not actually at risk of extinct, extinction because they are a managed livestock species. Okay, so to contrast with our used social bees, we have solitary bees. So solitary bees are the other 90% of all bee species in the world. And they don't interact with other bees at all unless they are mating. So their life cycle goes. The female, she's just emerged from her nest. Um, winter's over, spring is here. She's going to start foraging on pollen and nectar. She's going to find a new place to nest underground or in cavities. And she's going to pack that pollen and nectar into a tight ball called bee bread. Once she has a ball of pollen and nectar, she's going to deposit one egg on that bee bread, and then she's going to seal up that nest cell. And then she's going to do it again and again and again. And so, so she'll lay a certain number of eggs that season. And then once fall and winter arrives, her life will come to an end, but all her baby brood will overwinter in that underground or cavity nest. So 70% of all the solitary bees nest underground and 30% nest in a cavity. And a cavity is defined as um, any nook and cranny, a, a tunnel, could be a, a human made bee hotel. Um, I've had leaf cutter bees nest in between my patio stones before, wherever they can find a, a good tunnel. Next slide, okay. Um, so here's some examples of, of uh, bee hotels, or I'm sorry, of solitary bee nests. But the first picture is a bee hotel. So they need long tubes, you know, at least five to six inches long to make those nests. Um, below that, you're gonna see a couple of underground nests. So notice, you know, the holes in the ground. Um, a lot of people would see those holes and they, they might not think much of it, like, oh, you know, ants must live there. But if you see holes in the ground like this, um, I'd recommend pausing and watching. Look and see who comes out of those holes because you may have some solitary bees nesting in that area. Above the, the ground nest is a, is a, a little tiny bee nesting in a twig. Some solitary bees will nest in hollowed out twigs. Um, and others will nest, um, this is a leaf cutter bee on the, on the photos on the right, nesting in human made bee hotels. And here's what it looks like inside um, a twig, actually. So on the right, you'll see the bee bread and a larva on the bee bread. And then on the left, you'll see a bee, a bee going through a pupa stage because all bees go through a full metamorphosis, just like a butterfly. And then, okay, so we talked about our use social bees and our solitary bees. Right in the middle, we have our third category, and that is primitively eusocial. So in this category comprises of all our bumblebees. Now my personal opinion is queen bumblebees are the most hardy bees ever. They are just, um, they're just so hardy because they are the only bee that can overwinter as an adult bee. And so she's going to find a, a nice pile of leaves, a sheltered area, maybe a log pile, and she's going to go in a, a diapause, um, kind of like a hibernation state for the winter. And then spring arrives. Um, I've seen a lot of queen bumblebees out flying around right now. Uh, she's going to start foraging for pollen and nectar, and then she's going to find a hollowed out cavity space to start her colony. So she'll lay 
several generations of female worker bees that will keep the colony running. And then about midsummer, she's going to lay eggs that are uh, new males and new queens. So they will leave the nest and go on a mating flight. And then once fall and winter come around, um, that, that current colony will come to an end. And the only survivors will be those newly mated queens. So a primitively used social a bee, like a bumblebee, they have social characteristics and solitary characteristics. They only live a one-year life cycle, and they could live in an underground, hollowed-out space. But there's also a queen and worker bees um, keeping that colony running. So they share characteristics of both. And so in this presentation, we can't dive in um, to all the different kinds of bees today, but here's a look at a variety of the shapes and sizes and colors. So start watching those flowers and see what kind of bees you can see in your backyard. Um, we have everything. The, the photo in the top left is a teeny tiny little, um, it's a small carpenter bee in a bindweed flower. That gives you a perspective of, of scale and how tiny she is all the way to um, the, the, let's see, the second end from the right. That's a sunflower bee. Um, it's a Sebastra species. And look at the pollen on her hind legs. It almost looks like she's wearing big yellow fuzzy leg warmers. Um, and then furthest to the right, we have a leaf cutter bee. So you'll notice the pollen on the underside of her abdomen. The row below, uh, we have a little tiny, uh, a male mason bee. Um, or I'm sorry, a male leaf cutter bee on the, the very far left. Next to that, we have a, a green metallic sweat bee. So these bees are actually a, a metallic green color, but you can tell they're a bee. Look at the pollen on their hind legs. And then furthest to the right, we have a wool carter bee. Um, she, you'll find her on lamb's ear quite often because she's scraping the fuzz off the, the plant leaves to carry back to her nest um, to, to line her nest cells. So all different shapes and sizes and colors. And if you're interested, this is a good time to point out, um, if you want to learn more about the different categories and the different types of bees, there's still time to sign up for the Native Bee Watch Community Science Program. Um, just visit nativebeewatch.org and no experience necessary will teach you everything you need to know to, to collect data on bees. Okay, so here's your pop quiz. Um, it's really challenging to differentiate a bee from a fly and a wasp. So take a, a few seconds and look at each photo and think to yourself, is this a bee, a fly, or a wasp? So I'll give you a few seconds to talk about it or think about it. All right, so I know, you know, due to time, we're, we're not gonna spend too much time on this, but the first five photos are actually all fly species, all flies. And we'll talk about why in a minute. And I, I got to tell you, photo number five, when I took that photo, I thought I was taking a picture of a bumblebee, but it's actually a fly that mimics a bumblebee. And flies mimic bees and wasps because bees and wasps are stinging insects. So if they look like a stinging insect, predators may avoid it, um, humans included, actually. So flies um, mimic bees and wasps quite often. Photo number six is a wasp. Photo number seven and photo number eight are actually bees. So let's talk about how you can differentiate bees from flies and wasps. So wasps have long, narrow bodies usually. They are not hairy either. So uh, you'll see their exoskeleton, but you will not see hairs on their body. They have often um, what appears to be a a wasp waist, which almost looks like someone went and pinched um, the, the top of their abdomen. Um, it's often very pronounced in wasps. They typically have narrower, longer bodies than bees. Bees tend to be a little more round and robust. And they, they have long curly antenna and they don't carry pollen loads. So if you see an insect that's carrying pollen, there's a good chance that it's a bee. And flies, so flies are a little bit easier to tell the difference. So flies have eyes that go to the top of the head. We call them giant fly eyes. Um, look in the, in the pictures here, huge, huge eyes. And they also have short stubby antenna. 
So if you don't see an in antenna on an insect visiting a flower, there is a good chance it could be a fly. Now flies also have one pair of wings. Bees and wasps have two pairs of wings. This can be very hard um, to differentiate without a microscope. Um, so look for those giant fly eyes and, and those short stubby antenna. Most flies are not hairy, but there are exceptions like the, the photo above. That's a bee fly that mimics bees. Um, but most flies are not hairy. Flies also do not carry pollen loads on them. Flies can also hover. So if you see an insect that's suspended in midair above a flower, there's a good chance that that is likely a fly as well. So let's talk about bees then. Bees have four wings. They're gonna have hairs on most parts of their bodies. Um, different species of bees will have hairs in different places. The eyes are well separated on the sides of their head versus flies that's on the top of their head. Bees have their eyes well positioned on the sides of their head. They have long antenna. Oftentimes there's a bend in the antenna. Look at the, the picture of this honeybee, that bend in her antenna. And bees will carry pollen one of two ways. Honeybees and bumblebees will carry pollen in their pollen baskets on their hind legs. We call those corbiculae. So it, they look like balls of pollen and nectar attached to their hind legs. Other bees have scopae, which are special pollen collecting hairs. Um, it could be on their hind legs. It could be on the underside of their abdomen, um, but they won't be like balls of pollen and nectar. They'll just be pollen covering their hairs. So we'll see some more pictures. Um, bees are tend to be uh, rounder, more rounder and robust shaped than wasps and flies, but they come in all sizes, shapes, and colors. Okay, so let's look, this is our answer key for that pop quiz. So look at those five first five photos. You can see those giant fly eyes and short stubby antenna. On some of them, you can't even see the antenna. The wasp, we have a long narrow body, no hairs and no pollen loads either. The last two pictures are bees. Uh, we talked about the wool carter bee, um, her abdomen, is very much looks like a wasp, but you can see her head and her thorax and, and the underside of her abdomen all have hairs on them. And the last photo, you know, that's a little bit of a trick question that I threw in there. That's actually a cuckoo bee. Um, cuckoo bees are parasite bees that will parasitize other bees' nests. And since they, they parasitize other bee nests, they don't have to be pollinators. So they, they typically don't have hairs on their bodies. Um, you, you might see them visiting flowers for nectar, but they are technically not pollinators, even though they're a bee. So cuckoo bees are, are a trick question. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about bee stings because there's a lot of misinformation out there. For starters, 90% of all stings are caused by the Western yellow jacket. So that top photo above, that's the Western yellow jacket. Now, yellow jackets are, are the most aggressive wasp. And anytime you have a singing insect flying around your picnic, your barbecue, um, trash cans, you know, sweets, um, any, any human food sources, you can bet it's probably a Western yellow jacket. Now, wasps can sting more than once. Honeybees, however, they'll sting if they're really provoked um, or, the, or you, get, you step on one accidentally, um, but they can only sting once and they actually lose their life after they sting because they have a barb on the end of their stinger that stays in your skin. So when they try to fly off, um, it actually rips out um, um, part of their body so they, they, they can't survive. So bees, only sting if it's a very last resort. And wasps can sting multiple times. It's important to note that native bees, so solitary bees and also solitary wasps, either cannot or very rarely sting. So solitary bees and solitary wasps, um, they do their own thing. They don't have a, a large colony to protect. So they have no need to, um, to you know, protect their, 
they have no need to protect the colony. So they just do their own thing and, and oftentimes go unnoticed. Keep in mind the males cannot sting at all. The females could, but it's a much more milder sting. Like you might, you'll feel it, um, but it's, it's much more mild. And to get stung by a, a solitary bee or a solitary wasp, you would really have to handle that bee or have it accidentally pressed up against your skin. So when we think about creating pollinator habitats, the risk for stings is actually very low because yellow jackets, 90% of all stings, um, they, they aren't gonna forage on flowers for nectar. They're, they're much more attracted to, to human habitat and human food sources. So the, the pollinator habitat, you know, those bees um, really keep to themselves and do their own thing. So let's talk a little about a little bit more because I know wasps are, are um, a hot topic. So like I said, the Western yellow jackets are highly attracted to human food sources, which is why um, stings are also so common from yellow jackets. Um, they're scavengers. So most wasps are actually hunters and they will seek out other insects to hunt. But Western yellow jackets are scavengers. They'll typically feed on carrion or, or dead things, but when in a, in a human habitat, um, they'll go after human food sources. Now their, their life cycle is very similar to bumblebees. The only ones that survive over winter are those newly mated queens. So spring is here, the queens are out and she's looking for an underground nest to start her new colony. So she'll lay her eggs all summer and by you know July and August and early fall, she could have several hundred individuals in that nest. So what do you do if yellow jackets are a problem? Well, the, one of the easiest things you can do is go buy those yellow tube yellow jacket traps from the hardware store and put them out in April, April or now. You can do even do it now before the new queens start their colony. So hopefully you'll catch some of those queens before she can start a colony. When you put wasp traps out in July or August, there's already several hundred individuals in those colonies. The other thing to note for yellow jackets is they nest underground and only underground. So nests can be hard to find, but if you do come across a yellow jacket nest, they can, can be very dangerous because they will, they will protect their nest if they need to. So if there's a yellow jacket nest that's very close to, to human activity, um, really the best thing to do is consider hiring a, a, a pest control, a professional to remove it because it can be dangerous. Or if the nest is far away from human activity, you can leave it alone too, because that, remember, once fall and winter arrives, um, that colony won't be able to survive. So that's one of our nuisance species of wasps. The next other nuisance species is actually the European paper wasp. And they're the wasps that make those open-faced nests under our house eave or in a dark shed, any dark space they can find. And human, you know, houses and human habitat, there's a lot of those. So what can you do? Um, the wasp traps, the yellow jacket traps actually do not work on European paper wasps and they don't attract bees or anything either. That's important to note. So, um, you know, if, if a, there's a yellow jacket trap that's far, or I'm sorry, if there is a paper wasp nest um, up high and it's not bothering anyone, you can leave it. It's not going to hurt anyone because European paper wasps actually don't sting very much. Um, they, they don't want to sting unless their colony is threatened. They have the same life cycle. So they have one year life cycle and they do not return to the nest the following year. So nests can be removed um, if they're in a if they're in the way of human activity. Um, keep in mind, this is an invasive species. Been here since about 2001. They feed on pest caterpillars, but they also feed on butterfly caterpillars as well. So it's not going to hurt anything by by you know removing and um, killing European paper wasp nests. Okay, and one more thought on wasps. So we talked about the two nuisance species of wasps that attract the most attention. But keep in mind, we have a huge diversity of solitary wasps uh, in our gardens that most of the time they just do their own things and we barely 
even notice them. So don't let the two nuisance species, um, you know, change your, you know, affect your reputation or uh, affect how you think about wasps. Don't let them give wasps a bad reputation because wasps are very valuable. They um, provide pest control services and we need them in our gardens. Okay, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about beekeeping. So a lot of people assume if I want to help save the bees, I better start beekeeping. That's actually not true because honeybees are a managed livestock species. So honeybees have a variety of challenges that they're facing that we need to address, like the varroa mites um, that weaken colonies. But beekeeping isn't for everyone and, and it's not, quote, saving the bees. So if you're really interested in supporting pollinators and pollinator conservation and saving the bees, the best thing you can do is provide happy for all the wild bees and all the, the wild pollinators. So there, there is a time and place for beekeeping though. If you've got crops that are pollinated specifically by honeybees, if you're interested in the hobby and the honey um, and willing to invest the time and the, you know, willing to learn, it's a steep learning curve to, to be a beekeeper, then beekeeping might be right for you. But if you're interested in, in supporting the wild pollinators, consider providing habitats in your own landscape. And the last thing, I think this is my last slide, is bee swarms. So we are in swarm season. And if you come across a swarm, like in that picture, that can be a little bit alarming, but not to worry at all because before bees swarm, um, they, they've basically outgrown their hive. There's not enough space. So they feed on as much pollen, or I'm sorry, as much honey and sugar as they can. And then they leave in search of a new home because they're, they're full of, of sugar and they don't have a hive to protect. They're actually very docile. So they, there's a very low sting risk um, when, when they're in a in swarm mode. So no need to panic when you see a swarm um, and, and tell everyone around you too, this is what they're doing and call the swarm hotline. We have a network of beekeepers that are just waiting for that swarm of bees. They will come and collect it and give them a home in a hive. So uh, it's swarm season, probably through, you know, a little bit longer. Um, and it's, it's very cool to, to see this when they're in the States. Um, the picture in the, in, on the slide, I got up real close. I wasn't even wearing beekeeping gear. So very docile when you see a bee swarm. And on that note, I think I'm going to turn it over to Darren. Thanks, Lisa. While Darren's getting set up, I just want to mention, we're going to keep moving right along so that we can get through everything. Um, and we will answer some questions at the end. And yeah, take it away, Darren. Hey, thank you. Um, so yes, thank you, Lisa, for all of the fantastic information about who the pollinators are and um, how we can identify them. Um, she mentioned a couple of times the importance of habitat and what we can do to support those pollinators through creating habitat. So that's what we're gonna talk about now. Um, one of the very cool things is that even though we have so much urbanization happening, especially along the Front Range, but all over the country, um, is that habitat can be created really anywhere. Farms, roadsides, um, you know, right away, street right aways, college campuses, and in our own backyards. So um, one of the best examples that I like to point at is there was um, a, an abandoned parking lot in New York City, I believe it was in Harlem, um, and the community wanted to create a community garden. And so they got whatever, went through all the red tape, they were able to do that. Um, and, and so they got things planted and then they realized, oh, are we gonna have the, you know, the birds and the bees that we need for our garden? So they got some researchers to set out um, some, uh, some survey equipment and do some, some insect surveys. And they found over 50 bee species. So Lisa talked about how many species of bees there are. They found over 50 bee species um, that came, even though it was surrounded by a concrete jungle, that came and found that habitat and um, pollinated the fruit and veggie crops. So if you build it, they will come, which is so cool. Um, when we're talking about habitat, there are three real issues. So there's habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation. So loss, it's just being ripped up, built over, we don't have it. 
Fragmentation is it's being chopped up into lots of little pieces. And then degradation, meaning um, there might be bits and pieces of open space around, but it's not high quality. So we need to create and increase the habitat. We need to try to connect habitat, that's really key, and then improve the overall quality of the habitat. Um, I love showing this little cartoon. Um, you know, you've got the, the dad who's doing the mowing the lawn, just kind of doing the, the thing that we all do. Uh, and the little kid saying, hey, I think we need to have a talk about the bees and the flowers. And there he is standing in some, some lovely habitat. So when we're designing for pollinators, um, it's really key to understand that you can create a space that's beautiful for you. You get the curb appeal and it's really gorgeous and it also provides habitat. We just wanna think about how, like what elements we have in the space. So habitat is food, water, shelter, and space. And we can create that in a beautiful space. Um, more and more pollinator gardens and supporting pollinators is very mainstream, lots and lots of interest around it. Um, there was a time when it was a little thought to be like, oh, it's gonna be a little messy or I don't want to attract bees because I'm worried we're, I'm gonna get stung. Um, again, Lisa went into to all of that, like who's doing the actual stinging. Um, but a space doesn't have to be, you know, officially designated as a pollinator garden. It can just be a kind of your front yard, backyard, regular garden that provides pollinator habitat. So when we see things like this, spaces like this, kind of your typical um, urban suburban neighborhood, you have the house, you got some lawn, you got a tree and maybe some foundation plantings. That's not really the, that, that those homes don't really have a lot of habitat. So if you have a yard like that and you wanna bring in some habitat, the first thing to do is a site assessment. So you need to know what you're working with, what plant species you already have, and what the conditions are like in your space. So location is key for pollinators. Sunny areas are generally the best, and that's because most of our plant species um, that bloom have nice big blooms like sun, right? And so pollinators need flowers for the the pollen and the nectar. So sunny areas are generally best, but if you have a shady area, there are things you can plant there too. The larger, the better. So if you can connect your front yard to your backyard, or if you can, maybe you're working alongside your neighbor, if you can both have your front yards or your backyards full of pollinator habitat, the pollinators aren't going to see that fence line and think, oh, this is where this habitat starts and the next habitat begin or stops and the next habitat begins. They just see it as one big, wonderful space that's for them. So um, any way you can think about increasing the amount and connectedness of the back of the uh, habitat. So um, again, with design, you, we just kind of take some simple landscaping ideas. Um, and that is we want a good variety of plants. So that's more attractive to us if we've got some good colors and textures and different plant species. It's also good for them, for the pollinators. Um, if you think about it, our gardens are like their grocery store. So they show up and they say, okay, what's here? What, what, do, I, what do I want this week or what do I want today? Um, and different plants, the pollen and nectar of different plants have different makeups. So some uh, pollen is their protein source, nectar is their carbo carbohydrate source. So the pollen in particular has different amounts of protein and different vitamins and minerals in it. So we want to ha help them have a good varied diet, just like us. So you want a good variety of plants. You want to plant in groupings or swaths. And this is because, um, you know, pollinators can be teeny tiny and they have to expend a lot of energy to go out and forage and, and gather um, pollen and nectar. So if you have a swath or, or a grouping of one plant in one area, they can go work all those flowers and then take it back to the nest and then come back um, rather than kind of having to hop around from um, one patch to the other because they're always going to visit the same, um, generally speaking, they're going to visit the same species on any given foraging run. So they might go back to the nest and then go out again and hit a different species, but on that outing, they're going to go to the same one. Um, another thing to provide, this should probably make sense given uh, what Lisa talked about with our solitary bees, you can provide snags or dead wood. 
um, for those cavity nesters. Also provide some sunny undisturbed ground for the ground nesters. Um, generally speaking, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people on across the country about what's the, you know, what's the perfect recipe to uh, create space for ground nesting bees. Um, nobody really has the, the magic recipe, but there are some things that we know. You definitely want to avoid landscape fabric. If there's landscape fabric, the bees can't get through, the ground isn't accessible, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And they tend to like, this is very general uh, generalization, but they tend to like um, south facing gentle slopes. So kind of a gravelly, um, south facing gentle slope. But if you don't have that, you can still leave an area that's open. Um, there are also some studies that show that they prefer um, ground that has a little bit of like pea gravel, just a thin layer of that. So um, it's pretty hard to, you know, you might leave all these little patches of open ground and, and you just cross your fingers. Maybe they'll come, maybe they won't, but at least you tried. Um, and then this, the image on the bottom left is a great illustration. You know, Lisa had the awesome pictures of seeing the little mounds of dirt that look like anthills. Um, but this shows what it might look like or what it looks like underground. So you can see each female creates her own tunnel and her own nest. So that, that image is kind of like a neighborhood. Um, they're not all connected like uh, and working together necessarily like, like honeybees, but they have their own little areas. And then uh, Lisa touched on this too, you've got to provide larval food. So not just flowers. Um, flowers are great for the adults, but if you want to attract butterflies and moths, you have to have whatever the caterpillars are going to eat. Because if you don't feed the babies, you don't get the adults. Um, we're, you want to think about it with your landscape that we're basically replicating nature. And so you want to plant in layers, ground cover, perennials, grasses, shrubs, trees. You're kind of planting in those different layers and different um, wildlife, pollinators, birds are all going to use different areas of that. Um, from a design perspective, we always suggest that you plant in odd groups, threes, fives, or sevens. Once you get to seven, it's a big enough mass that you can't really tell. But planting in evens kind of looks weird to the eye. So we plant in groups um, of odd numbers. So um, remember food, water, shelter, and space. Water is important. Um, uh, along the Front Range, there are a lot of irrigation ditches and ponds and things like that. But you can bring in something like the top left image there is just a plant saucer filled with pebbles and rocks and bark. And then you can fill that with water. Um, and that can be a little uh, um, area for pollinators to get water, especially when we're going through really hot, dry periods. Um, you just want to make sure that if you provide something like that, that there's an escape route. So you don't like bird baths are not great for pollinators because if they land in there, they don't have any way to get out. Um, so have rocks or something kind of sticking out so that they have a little escape route. Um, oftentimes irrigation will be enough, but just something to think about, especially in the hot dry months. Whoops. Um, one thing to note about butterflies, uh, people that are really, really into butterfly gardening, they'll actually create little wet areas and create little seeps because the male butterflies do a thing called puddling where um, sometimes you see it in parking lots because they like sort of gravelly areas and they kind of do this dipping motion where they're going, they're collecting water, but they're also collecting minerals. So again, providing that opportunity is key. Okay, so we talked about food, uh, water. So here's some shelter. Um, you can create these bee, bee blocks, bee condos. There are all different kind of ways to do that. For the sake of time, I'm gonna keep kind of cruising through, but you can look online and find all the instructions on how to do these. Um, the Xerces Society has some really good information. Um, CSU has some good information and Utah State uh, University all have good information on how to create those. So, okay, food, water, shelter, space. So we've kind of touched on all of those, but if we talk a bit more about food, um, incorporating native plants is really key. Those are gonna support the specialist species and just support more diversity. So um, the Xerces Society, which I mentioned, they did a study that showed that, um, native, that, that native plants are four times um, more attractive to native bees than exotic flowers. So they will go to introduced exotic species, but the native plants that they co-evolved with 
are more attracted to, attractive to them and also are going to provide more uh, better um, it's, it's a better food source. So there's still a lot of research out there that needs to happen on this, but there are some studies that show that some of our introduced species um, of, of plants are kind of like candy. So they don't have necessarily the protein and the mineral makeup that our native species need. So something to keep in mind. And then native plants tend to uh, have pure, fewer pests and diseases and require fewer inputs. So, um, the Colorado Native Plant Society and several other partners um, developed these booklets. It breaks the state into five um, and they're low water native plants for Colorado gardens. Um, there are, you can get this on the CSU Extension website. You can also get it on the CONIPS website. Um, but in these are plant lists and actually uh, little sample designs. So just to sort of give you an idea of plants that, that go well together, look good, and have the same um, characteristics and same, or same needs, cultural needs. So again, when we're talking about habitat and native plants, it's important to know that native plants can be incorporated into an existing landscape. So it's not all or nothing, but our gardens and landscapes are dynamic systems. So as something dies off, you can you know, replace it with a native plant and you can sort of slowly build that over time if you don't wanna just go completely uh, to natives all at once. So again, um, Lisa talked about the, the huge diversity of particularly with bees, but all the pollinators, there are different sizes and shapes. They need different um, they need different sizes and shapes of flowers. So you want to think about that. So some need big flowers, some need little flowers. You can see that image there. Um, that's a huge uh, carpenter bee head with a Perdita minima female uh, placed on the placed right on there for scale. So you can see the size difference. So those two are going to need different flowers. And then phenology is important to keep in mind. So you want to choose a plant palette that blooms as early in the season all the way through the summer and as late into the fall as possible. Again, because we're providing, um, we're providing that food for the pollinators. So if you attract something to your spring blooming garden and then you have nothing for, you know, say July and August, then those bees have to go somewhere else. Okay, so now we're going to briefly touch on sort of the relationship between um, insects and flowers. So um, insects have compound eyes. It's important to know that they see very differently than we do. So their, their lenses, it's really obvious. It's obvious on bees, but really obvious on dragonflies. If you think about the big dragonfly eyes and they're um, made up of lots of different omatidia or like sort of different lenses and they all point in a different direction. They can detect really fast movement. This is part of how they Get away so quickly if they um, perceive a threat. But uh, what's really key as far as flowers and pollinators and insects go is that they see in different uh, light wavelengths. So we see into infrared a little bit, whereas pollinators and insects see into the UV. So that middle image there, the bright yellow, that's what we see when we look at this flower. But what they see is the image on the right. And that is a bullseye, right? It looks like a target with a bullseye. And that flower is saying, this is where the good stuff is. Come and get the nectar and the pollen. So the flower is signaling to the insect. Flowers also have nectar guides, which are sort of like landing strips, um, runway landing strips. So you can see the purple lines of this iris sort of going towards the middle. Um, and then that yellow mark. So that again is a cue to the nectar source. There's something called pollinator syndromes that's kind of fun to check out. Um, you can go to pollinator.org and there are other sites if you were probably to just Google pollinator syndromes, but it kind of breaks down the, the pollinator and the type of flower that they like that they're attracted to. So if we go into the B column, the one, two, three, third column over, you can see the color they're attracted to tend to be bright white, yellow, blue, or UV. Um, they tend to like flowers that have a fresh, mild, pleasant odor. Um, nectar is usually pleasant, et cetera, et cetera. So you can kind of see, depending on what you're wanting to attract, you can choose flowers that have these characteristics. 
So plants that are not so much for pollinators, we're gonna go through a few examples right now um, of ones that are good and ones that are not so good. So there's a, not a lot going on here. If we're thinking about habitat, food, water, shelter, and space, not a ton of food here. Um, maybe a little bit of shelter, maybe there's some water from irrigation or dew, and there's some space, but not much else. This is looking better, got some, got some flowers. Grass companions are something that people are talking a lot about. Dandelions, clover, some people call them weeds, other people call them grass companions. Um, I know we're bumping right up to one o'clock. Um, so for those of you who have to leave, um, we're glad that you joined us and this session is being recorded so you can come back and catch the last bit if you are gonna miss any. Um, I think I have about five more minutes, so. Um, okay, so plants that are also not for pollinators are double flowers. So double flower, double and triple flowers are flowers that people have bred to be really ruffly and really beautiful with lots and lots of petals. But what's happened is that they've, with their breeding, they basically bred out the reproductive parts of the flower. So you don't have the um, anther and stamens that hold the pollen. Um, and instead you have the pretty petals, which is nice for us, but not great for the pollinators. So these are both hollyhocks, similar color. Um, the one on the right, the single flower, that's great. That's what a pollinator needs. You can see all that pollen is just falling off the flower. So that's what you want for pollinators. If you have double, double flowers that you absolutely love, then by all means keep those. Just make sure you're also including some single flowers. Same thing here, double flower, gorgeous to us, not so much for a bee. There's the same um, species, different variety, and you can see all that bright yellow pollen that is just calling for a pollinator. Um, I use this example because um, this is at Bouchard Gardens. I took this picture and this little bee, she was just working and working, trying to go through those petals, trying to get something, and there was just nothing for her, so. Kind of a sad story. I'm sure she made it to um, another flower that had plenty of pollen. So a quick recap, when we're planting and designing gardens for pollinators, um, first of all, there are many, many pollinators. Um, just even within bees, there are many different kinds of bees. And you, it's important to know them so that you can design for them. You want to think about food, water, shelter, and space in your yard. How can you create that? You want to plant natives to support more species. Again, it's not all or nothing. You can incorporate them in slowly over time. Super important to pay attention to that bloom time, the phenology. So again, having things bloom as early as possible all the way through the summer and into the fall. Um, and that's what we want to do anyway for ourselves, right? We want, thing, we want our flowers or our gardens to be blooming. We're mimicking nature and we wanna to remember to sit back, observe and enjoy, um, enjoy all those pollinators because that's part of what is so fun. Uh, you could hear the excitement in Lisa's voice when she's talking about all the bees and the different pollinators. It's so fun to plant a beautiful garden for, um, for yourself, for your neighbors, but also for these pollinators and see, like sit back and really see who comes and visits and um, who's attracted to your garden, so. With that, um, we will end and thank you everybody for joining us. And I guess, should we do some Q&A, Lisa and Amy? I'm gonna stop sharing. Yes, let's, uh, let's see if there's any additional questions. You guys can pop those in the chat while I try to figure out how to turn my video back on. <laughs> I don't see it. <laughs> I'll just stay off video. Oh, here we go. All right. Thank you so much, Lisa and Darren. That was so much great information um, and so interesting. Yes, interesting, Carol. Um, we did have a question earlier that came in about ambush bugs and um, someone was finding them on their sunflowers and they, they weren't sure if they should if they should be there, if they were gonna hurt the bees. So um, we answered that in the chat, but Lisa, if you want, or Darren, if you wanna expand on that, that would be great. Yeah, so ambush bugs are part of the garden ecosystem and they're gonna go after whatever prey is easiest to catch. So oftentimes that can be bees, which which I know is very sad, but um, they aren't really contributing to, to bee decline or, or hurting bee populations in any way. So they're not necessary to control by any means. Um, 
you know, if you prefer not to have that ambush bug there, you know, you could certainly uh, remove it, uh, but they, they really aren't hurting bee populations as a whole. So I tend to leave it. Um, that's one thing about watching bees, you start to notice all these biodiversity interactions in the garden, um, which I think is really fascinating. So I tend to leave them there. And I will just add, I'll add that they're really considered beneficial because they'll go after grasshoppers, they'll go after other things that might be pests in your garden. So they don't only go after bees. Yes, and I've also found them on sunflowers. So they love those sunflowers. Um, another question just came in. Uh, from Nat, how do you connect the front yard to the backyard gardens? Yeah, right. So I was talking about you must connect them, but how do you do that? Um, so that's simply, you know, if you have a side yard, you know, kind of having just having things, plants connected as much as possible. So um, if you have a side yard, you can plant that. If you don't, you know, if your house is such that you don't have a side yard, then maybe you can't connect them. Um, but I would say that if you have a nice garden with pollinator species in the front or back, um, and then you add more of those species to the front or back, whatever, if you have it in both, they're gonna find it because it's generally in the same area. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have that opportunity to connect and have it be contiguous, that's ideal. So I just did this last weekend at my, so I just moved into a new build place with a brand new landscape, nothing there. And to connect my front yard to the backyard, I used some shade dry shade species. Mm -hmm. um, columbines would be a great thing because usually between your houses, you've got a lot of shade because you've got house mm -hmm. next to house, right? So mm -hmm. I'll just throw that out there as an option. Columbines would be a great thing to maybe help those, those critters to the back. Mm -hmm. It was fun. <laughs> uh, let's see, I think that might be all of our questions. Okay. Yeah, there was just... Somebody talked about no mow May. We, I kind of covered that in the chat, but you know, not mowing in those early months to keep some of those first bloomers around. Any thoughts on no mow May? I do have some thoughts. Yeah, okay. that sounds much bigger more yours. and more popular. I've gotten more questions this summer than ever before. And it's a very nuanced answer. Um, it's not a black and white thing. And it might work for some people, but it's not gonna work for others. So, so for instance, um, let's say you have a turf grass lawn. If you've got clover growing in it and you don't have kids or dogs that are gonna be running around, um, you could leave, you know, no mow May. Uh, but when you have to go mow that turf grass a month later, first of all, it's gonna be really hard to mow. Um, second of all, it's, maybe not the best for your turf health either. Um, sometimes turf will get matted down and everything. Um, so, so in a turf grass setting, may, it's probably not ideal unless you have a lot of those weedy flowers growing in it. Um, in terms of more natural spaces, maybe that's not irrigated. That might be more of a consideration, but here in Colorado, we have to worry about wildfire fire danger too. So if mowing is gonna keep your wildfire risk down, it's probably better to, to mow, you know, keep, keep the risk down, but maybe consider adding flowers elsewhere, like doing other things that can help the pollinators. Oh, yeah, so you're gonna add, you gonna add? Um, yeah, I was just gonna, so I agree with everything that Lisa said. And I will just add, if you have, spaces that are a little more like small acreage or a little more natural areas, not just a, a sort of urban yard. Um, no, May is the perfect time for cool season pest grasses like smooth brome and cheatgrass. That's the perfect time for those to really flourish. So if you're, let, if you're not mowing and you're just saying, oh, go for it, you know, they're really gonna take hold a little bit more. And mowing is actually one way to kind of control those a little bit. So like Lisa said, very nuanced. Mm -hmm. very nuanced <laughs> in theory it sounds yeah. nice but you got to take a lot into consideration yeah I think it's definitely more of a thing in the eastern part of the United States where their turf is it just doesn't have the the I don't know what the word is it, it doesn't have to deal with as much as growing turf here in Colorado mm -hmm. it just grows and so for for the East Coast, it's a big thing. They're leaving their violets and their clover and all that because it's part of their lawn. So 
Um, but definitely different here in Colorado. Thank you so much for those answers because that's just a little bit different than what um, I had put into the Q&A. <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining us. Hopefully we'll be back. We might try to do a fall series, maybe. And then um, we'll be back for next spring as well. Keep learning, keep visiting CSU Extension, contact your local office if you have questions and we will see you later. So thanks everyone for joining.